Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Daily Dose of Deacon Harold. Uh, it's great to be with you again today, and this time live. Uh, it's uh, Friday in the 10th week of Ordinary Time. And uh, before we get started today, I, for, I think I forgot to mention yesterday the background that I have. This is from the Monastery of Monte Cassino in Italy. This is the monastery founded by St. Benedict. And uh, this is the main monastery where he lived. And uh, this is an altar uh, in the church at Monte Cassino. And this is also the place where St. Benedict is buried alongside his twin sister, St. Scholastica. You know, uh, it's, it's interesting. You know, I wonder how many, I, I'm not, don't know for sure. I know that there's a combination of brother and uh, sister saints and cousins, but twins, be interesting to find out. Uh, how many sets of twins there are that are saints. Uh, well, we know for sure that St. Uh, Benedict and St. Scholastica are uh, one of those wonderful sets of twins that are saints and are buried right here in this church. And since we're talking about the Eucharist, I wanted to show the tabernacle here inside the church of Monte Cassino in Italy. Uh, love to go back there one day. Uh, because I, you know, I can't, I, I, you know, I, I obviously have a strong affinity for the Benedictines, and so, uh, you know, it's, um, uh, it'd be awesome to go back there and to relive that incredible experience uh, that we had there in Italy. Um, also, I want to take this opportunity to say congratulations uh, to Nathan and Teresa, uh, two friends of mine who are getting married today. So I wish I could be there, but, you know, the whole COVID-19 and travel thing and all of that. So, but I'm so glad you're going to have, be able to have your families there to celebrate this amazing day. Uh, we're so honored to uh, help you during your marriage preparation. And uh, I, I just wish you guys nothing but the best. You know, I, I'm uh, really going to be praying for you guys today and for your marriage and the Lord uh, today bless you and strengthen you always with the gift of uh, the, with the gift, the sacramental gift of grace that he gives you in marriage and they have some beautiful kids. And um, again, just congratulations and blessings to you on, on this uh, incredibly awesome day uh, that the two of you become one. Well, today is uh, day nine, the last day of our novena to Venerable Augustus Tolton, America's first black priest, lived from 1854 to 1897. And I uh, hope you've been enjoying the novena. And so we begin the last day of this novena in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh God, we give you thanks for your servant and priest, Father Augustus Tolton, who labored among us in times of contradiction, times that were both beautiful and paradoxical. His ministry helped lay the foundation for a truly Catholic gathering in faith in our time. We stand in the shadow of his ministry. May his life continue to inspire us and imbue us with that confidence and hope that will forge a new evangelization for the church we love. Father in heaven, Father Tolton's suffering service sheds light upon our sorrows. We see them through the prism of your son's passion and death. If it be your will, O God, Glorify your servant, Father Tolton, by granting the favor we request through his intercession, so that all may know the goodness of this priest, whose memory looms large in the church he loved. Complete what you have begun in us, that we might work for the fulfillment of your kingdom. Not to us the glory, but glory to you, O Lord, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are our God, living and reigning forever and ever. Amen. O Father Augustus Tolton, you whose life demonstrated the fruit of the Holy Spirit's gift of fortitude and perseverance, pray for us and strengthen us as in perseverance as we cry out for God's mercy for, and please state your intention here, Pray, Father Augustus Tolton, that God will hear our cry and answer us according to his will. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I 
Hope you enjoyed that novena. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to the day uh, where the venerable Augustus Toltus becomes Saint Augustus Toltus. Let's pray for that as we pray uh, for um, uh, racial justice and for uh, you know peace to come back into our country and, uh, and through our world. We've been thrown into tumult because of COVID-19 and all the racial tension and the rioting, all that stuff going on. And um, again, let's remember that Christ calls us to be, not to think and act like the world, but to, as Paul says, to put on the mind of Christ. And of course, this Sunday, we've been talking about the Eucharist all week. You know, we, we did a four-part part walkthrough, Mysterium Fidei, uh, St. Pope Paul VI's wonderful document on the Eucharist uh, that was written in 1965. So the year that the, the Second Vatican Council ended, which went from 1962 to 65, and he wrote a beautiful document on the Eucharist. We walked through that uh, the first four days of this week, Monday through Thursday. Well, this Sunday is Corpus Christi, the Feast of the Body and Blood of Christ. And so uh, I want to share some reflections with you about the gospel reading uh, for this weekend. And, um, you know, there's a couple of things uh, to mention here. Um, first of all, we, we should talk about what's kind of leading up to what we're going to be hearing in the gospel um, this weekend. Um, because there's no confusion or misinterpretation of what Jesus is saying in the gospel today. All right, let's, be, be, let's be clear about that. So we have to remember the context in which Jesus is speaking. All right, so let's, let's back up, okay? So prior to what we're going to hear in the gospel this, this, uh, this weekend, uh, Jesus had just fed the multitude, the 5,000 people, uh, with five loaves of bread and two fish. And then Jesus promptly goes off by himself to escape from those who are trying to make him a king. You know, think about it. He did this amazing miracle, and he's like, oh, he's the, he's a son of God. Let's make him king. So he goes off by himself, but the next day they track him down. At, uh, and at that time, Jesus says, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. All right. So he's saying, like, you guys are following me around because you saw this great miracle and your bellies are full. Uh, but that's just a precursor. Don't uh, spend your lives um, pursuing food that's going to make you hungry again. All right. Pursue the food that's going to give you eternal life. And I am going to tell you about that food right now. So he's preparing them because sometimes before people are willing or able to hear the message of the gospel, they, they have to be ready. So a lot of times, like, for example, at our RCM Visit the Paul conference at our uh, parish, and I'm sure the same is uh, uh, the, the situation is same at other St. Visit the Paul conferences as well in parishes, that before you can preach the gospel to people who are poor, you have to feed them. You have to provide for their basic needs, food, clothing, shelter. Uh, and, and then they'll be open to hearing more of what you have to say, right? The gospel message. And it's the same thing here. Uh, Jesus feeds them bodily. He provides for their physical needs, and now he's going to provide for their spiritual needs. And he's preparing them for that. Uh, and then Jesus, then as he begins uh, uh, what's called the bread of life discourse uh, in John chapter 6, he says he recalls what happened in the Exodus in Israel. He says, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven. My father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. To which the people responded, Lord, give us this bread always. Okay. So it's an interesting parallel here to the woman at the well. Remember, Jesus says, give me a drink. He goes, well, how could you ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? And, and, and so she thinks he's going, you know, give me a, a drink of water from the well. And Jesus said, well, he talks about water that, that she can drink from and she'll never be thirsty again. And she goes, oh, give me that water, right? And so same thing here. He talks about the bread that came down from heaven, the manna in the desert that their, four, their forebearers ate, their forefathers ate. Um, and, 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 uh, but now Jesus is talking about the bread that comes down from heaven that gives life to the world. They said, yes, that's what we want. We want that. Give us more of that. Right? So Jesus knows that nothing in this world can ever satisfy the deepest longing and desires of our hearts. Nothing in this world. 
can satisfy that. Not even your spouse, right? Because that is a place uh, that's reserved for God. The deepest longing and desire of our hearts is to have a rich, intimate relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus knows that we are, what we're really starving for is real truth and beauty in the midst of a culture of sin and, and death, a midst of culture of confusion, a midst of culture of fear and anxiety. So he says to the people, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Bow! God, that, those, are, those are words of power. Those are words of authority, because those are words that come from the mouth of God himself. Man, I, I mean, it, it wouldn't be great to, knowing what we know now to be there in that place in uh, Capernaum, Capernaum, in Capernaum, where Jesus is preaching the beauty and the truth that he's the one that came down from heaven uh, and he's going to raise us up on the last day. You know, but what, <laughs> what was the people's reaction? You, you got to remember, they're still trying to figure out who Jesus is here, you know, and, and they were upset. Why were they upset? Not because Jesus calls God his father, no. Not that Jesus says that he will give them eternal life for those who believe in him, no. They don't even address Jesus' claims that he's going to raise them up on the last day. That's not what they're upset about. What are they upset about? Because the scripture says, because uh, the scripture tells us that Jesus said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. Because he's saying that he comes from God and that you know, only God can give life, that he's going to give life. So you see the implication? He's, he's kind of saying that I'm God. So what's Jesus' response to this? Remember, Jesus came to draw people to himself. He came to draw people to himself so he could lead people into the heart of, the, of the God the Father, into the bosom of God the Father, into the life of the Trinity, to share life with God. That's what he came to do. But what is his response? Do they... Does he apologize? Does he say, oh, guys, I'm sorry you misinterpreted me? No. Does he say, I'm only speaking symbolically? Absolutely not. Jesus says to, to them again, he doubles down. I am the bread of life. Uh, if, if anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give you for the life of the world is my flesh. That's sarx in Greek, which means literally flesh on the bone, right? So I'll give you, and so now this leads us to what we're gonna hear in the gospel uh, for Corpus Christi. Now, for the second time, they're upset with Jesus. You know, first he said he could get the out from heaven. Now they're upset because he says he'll give, give him his flesh to eat. Um, now, to answer this question, we have to ask, how did the people understand what Jesus was saying to them? And the reason why we have to ask that question, because some people will say that, well, the, the flesh that Jesus is speaking about here is his word, is his teaching. That's what the flesh is. And um, no, because the word sarx literally means flesh on the bone, right? So, uh, so that's why they say, how can this man give us his flesh uh, sarks to eat trogon, which means to gnaw and to chew. So that's what they heard him saying, that he's literally giving them his flesh to eat. The Jews were repulsed because they heard Jesus say clearly and directly that they must eat his flesh. Now, Jesus sees they're upset. What is his response? Does he say, wait a minute, no need to get upset, my friends. I was only speaking symbolically. I was only using a metaphor to make my point. It's only a sign. It's only a symbol. Is that what he says? No. <clears throat> Jesus continues. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal 
life. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood lives in me and I in him. And he who eats me will live because of me. He who eats this bread will live forever. So Jesus emphatically drives the point home. Now, a couple of things about what Jesus says here. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. All right now, remember he he's drawing a parallel now. Remember he talked about the bread that came down from heaven, the manna, the manhut, right? Which in Hebrew which means what is it? Because they didn't know what it was, but it was the heavenly food from the heaven, uh, the manna, and they they ate that. Now, uh, J- Jesus says, "I am the bread that will give you life forever." Remember, the manna only sustained them for the forty years in the desert, and then the Passover we see that Jesus is the lamb of God. We talked about this yesterday. He takes away the sins of the world and they had to eat and consume the lamb. So Jesus said, I've not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. So he is the fulfillment of the bread coming down from heaven. That's what it was pointing to. The lamb that the male unblemished lamb that that they had that slaughter and eat that took away the sins of the world is pointing toward Christ, the true lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So now he's, he's showing that, that, he, that in him is the fulfillment of the manna, is the fulfillment of the Passover. And that's why I have life forever. Why? Because it's the perfect sacrifice. Because God himself is both the priest, the one that's making the offering, and the victim, the one who is sacrificed. You cannot get a more perfect sacrifice than when God himself is the priest and the victim. And that's what he's trying to, to get across to them. And, and because of he's going to conquer death, that, he, that we will have life forever. And just like death, mentioned this yesterday, death passed over the, uh, the, the Israelites before they uh, uh, fled to the desert, when the angel of death passed over them because they saw the blood on the lintel of the doorpost and they consumed the lamb. Same thing. Jesus spilled his blood on the cross, and now we must consume the lamb and so that we can have life forever. Jesus came to save us, to lead us from the darkness of sin into the light of the Father's truth. Jesus would never say or do anything that would lead people away from a relationship of loving and life-giving communion with God. Jesus is speaking words of truth. The disciples get really upset and they say, this is a hard saying, who can listen to it? So, I mean, they're like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. What's this dude saying? He he did these miracles. He fed us with this 5,000, he fed the 5,000 people with loaves and a couple of fish. And now he's talking about eating his flesh. What's going on here? Jesus knows that they're upset. Jesus knows that they're taking him and hearing him literally. But once again, Jesus does not apologize. He does not make excuses. He does not try to clear up any misunderstandings, nor in any way does he take back anything that he said. He says, in fact, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Spirit and life, the words I just spoke. So what did he do? What did people do? They walked away from him. They walked away from him. And and so what is this John 6 incident? What is this pointing to? It's pointing to the Last Supper, the night before he freely gave his life up for us in sacrifice on the cross. Jesus fulfilled the words of the Corpus Christi gospel. Uh, After the Last Supper, um, at the Last Supper, he gave to the church, the wonderful sacrifice and sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. Bread and wine became his body and blood. And he gave the apostles the power and the authority to do the same. Do this in remembrance of me. He just doesn't say, when you do this, remember me. You know, the the word do there is not like hacer in Spanish or facere in Latin, which means to do or to make. Uh, It's asa in Hebrew. And asa, if you look at how that word is used in Leviticus, for example, uh, it's a technical Jewish terminology for offering a sacrifice of uh, uh, something that you can't kill, grain, wine, oil, incense, right? right? Those things don't bleed. So, so for example, they offer um, bulls, ox, turtle doves, goats, 
and you can slaughter those. But, the, but grain, wine, incense, oil, you can't kill those things. You can't use the same word for slaughter, which is zarach. You have to use the word asa, which means to do. And if you look at how it's used, for example, Leviticus chapter 2 and Leviticus chapter 5, it's an offering that's made of uh, a, a, an unbloody offering that's made for the forgiveness of sins, typically while incense is rising. And remember, Melchizedek, the, the, the great king of righteousness, what did, uh, what did uh, he offer uh, for, for Abram? Bread and wine. I remember Psalm 110, the messianic psalm written by David. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Of course, pointing to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who offered the same thing Melchizedek offered, bread and wine. Uh, and he says, do this in remembrance. And we talked about this before, that zacher, or, or anamnesis in Greek, or zacher in Hebrew, has, has the, the sense of memory is something that's alive, that's living, right? So we're not killing Christ over and over and over again. It's the graces and the blessings of that one event that's made real and present now. And so when, we, when Christ is offered on the altar in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, we are at Calvary. It's the one sacrifice of Christ made real and present on the altar at every Mass. And he also said, drink my blood. That's the blood in Leviticus 17. There was a prohibition against drinking blood because blood made atonement by reason of the life. And now Jesus says, I want my life in you. See, it all comes around full circle from, from the Old Testament to John chapter 6, to the institution narratives that we hear in the Synoptic Gospels and in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, right? Uh, it's beautiful. So let me speak clearly so that there is no mistake. <laughs> the Holy Eucharist is the body and blood together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, in the sacrament, the whole Christ is truly really and substantially present. We receive the living God in Holy Communion because that's the deepest form of intimacy we can have with God on earth when we unite our bodies with his. Again, there's, there's a, a looking, uh, a foreshadowing of this in, Ge in Genesis chapter two. The, uh, the, Therefore, a man leaves father and mother and cleans to his wife and the two become one flesh. So Christ the bridegroom gives life to his bride, the church, and the two become one flesh. We unite Christ's body with our bodies in that blessed sacrament. Just like the, the, the bridegroom in Genesis 2 gives life to his bride, uh, Eve, Christ, the bridegroom, gives life to his bride, the church, on earth in the Eucharist in anticipation of him giving us life forever in heaven. So what does the Eucharist do? It unites heaven and earth, thanks to Jesus, who, became the, who was the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. When Jesus entered the living monstrance, the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the eternal word brought to the eyes of faith a new and radiant vision of God's glory. In him, we see our God made visible and so are caught up in the love of the God that we cannot see, right? And so he, the, the, the Eucharist makes God real and visible for us 2,000 years after Christ's death and resurrection. So in the holy sacrifice of the mass, Jesus Christ lifts heaven, lifts earth to heaven as he was lifted up on the cross, the victim and priest and sacrifice of, for our salvation. John the Baptist pointed to him, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Jesus himself later declared that he was freely giving his life for us when he said, The Father loves me because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me. So Jesus did not commit suicide. The, the membership, the greatest gift that you can give is to lay down your life for your friends. He had to conquer the worst effect of original sin, which is death. Death cuts us off from God's life, not forever, because death is just a transition 
from our pilgrim journey on earth to our final ultimate destination in heaven. We are living here in order to get there. Right? And Jesus is the, is the, the connector, the bridge to, that makes that happen. And it's the Eucharist, that spiritual food for the journey. Uh, and so uh, Jesus is, is the worthy lamb that talks about in, in the book of Revelation that was slain. He talks about receive power and riches, wisdom and strength, honor and glory and praise. One of my favorite lines from the book of Revelation. So my friends, in the Eucharist, Jesus gives us a pledge of eternal life, a sure way to heaven. He gave his own guarantee. This is the bread which comes down from heaven so that a person may eat of it <clears throat> and not die. I am the living bread, our Lord says, that comes down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh for the life of the world. Amen. <laughs> I don't tell you, man. But uh, I, God, I love our Catholic faith. And I love the fact that we can celebrate and still have Jesus with us to this very day. Not just a sign or a symbol of Jesus, but, but the Lord himself in that most blessed sacrament. You know, uh, you know usually when, we, when a loved one dies and goes away, what do we have to remember? Maybe video recordings, maybe a picture, um, maybe their voice on the answer machine or something like that on, on our phone. You know, but Jesus gives us much more than that. He gives us the gift of himself, sacramentally real, true, and present in that most blessed sacrament. So again, um, let us use this time, this troubled and tumultuous time that we're in to renew and strengthen our faith in Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. We've seen so many wonderful signs of this already. We've seen Eucharistic processions by bishops and priests. We've seen bishops and priests in airplanes, blessing. Uh, the cities from COVID-19, we see Eucharistic processions in response to the, the racial tension and violence in our country. We see, so the, the, the answer is Jesus Christ. So let's never take our faith in the Eucharist for granted again. Let us always look to Jesus. Let us spend time with the one that we love in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass and the Eucharistic Adoration. Let us not be afraid to open ourselves and to pour ourselves out in love before the Lord to really connect our hearts with his most blessed and sacred heart, especially during this month of June, right? The, the month of the sacred heart. So let's renew and re-energize and re reinvigorate ourselves and be nourished over and over again with Jesus Christ in that most blessed sacrament. And let's help spread faith in the Eucharist throughout the world so that all may come to know that it is Jesus Christ who alone can save them. No one comes to the Father except through me. And that when he gives us himself as food, he's nurturing us uh, to help us on that journey to get to heaven. Uh, amen. So, uh, well, thank you for joining me today. And uh, I hope you can join me next week as well. We're going to have uh, some, some uh, awesome shows next week. And um, don't forget to follow me on, uh, on Facebook and Twitter. You know, uh, I have two Facebook accounts and Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn and all that good stuff. And also, if you can subscribe to my YouTube channel, you know, because uh, all my videos are posted there as well. And let's take a look to see uh, who's here today uh, live. Uh, let's see who's, uh, who's watching today. Um, uh, oh, my good friend, uh, Troy, uh, McIntosh, Leroy, one of my good friends from, uh, from Notre Dame. Uh, love him. Anthony Piercy, childhood friend. In fact, the guy who taught me how to play baseball. <laughs> actually, uh, very, very good. Friend. Actually family, more like family than friends live, live right up the street from us. Uh, and April, uh, and congratulations. Uh, to you and, and the family for uh, Teresa's wedding coming up uh, very shortly here, I'm sure. Uh, and oh, Chris Christu from St. Benedict's. Uh, awesome. Uh, good to see you here. And uh, Scott and Andy and Heather and Paul and Phil uh, from Portland here and Oscar and uh, all of you who are joining us. Uh, gosh, thank you guys so much. I, I appreciate your, your, your love and support. 
It really means uh, the world to me. And thanks for joining me for another Daily Dose of Deacon Harold. And uh, I'm wishing you guys a great weekend. And we close, as we always do, with uh, a prayer and a blessing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, we worship you living among us in the sacrament of your body and blood. May we offer to our Father in heaven a solemn pledge of undivided love. May we offer to our brothers and sisters a life poured out in loving service to that kingdom. Will you live with the Father in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I am heading off to confession, which I go to every month. So you guys have a great weekend. I'll see you again on Monday for another daily dose of Deacon Harold. God bless you guys. Bye-bye.